Hi guys, this is Charlie from the Mobile 10X forums. I hope you're well. So in the last few weeks, through my digital and mobile consultancy, Available Gains, I've been analysing and, and looking at some of the psychological factors uh, that are present within successful mobile games. And the results have been really surprising for me, and they've helped me identify why certain big hit games have been really successful. So what I ended up doing was putting a couple of decks together, one about Candy Crush and another about um, the psychology of si successful city building games, um, such as Clash of Clans. Um, I've then shown these to Patrice, uh, who you probably know from the forum as well. And what we thought was best in order to share these with the, re the rest of you guys was for me to, to video me going through this deck um, and then having you guys uh, feedback through the forums and uh, you can always email me in as well and ask me any questions that you have and we'll just try and stimulate a bit of a, a bit of um, conversation um, and a bit um, a bit more brainstorming about how mobile games can become more psychologically enabled um, to make the user more addicted. Um, so that's essentially what this deck is all about. It's all about how, to, how um, successful mobile games are making users more addicted through certain psychological cues. So first of all, like I said, uh, we're going to look at Candy Crush and then about halfway through uh, we'll switch and then we'll look at um, the psychology of successful city building games. So the reason why we're looking at Candy Crush in the first place is you probably remember about a month ago or so Candy Crush actually went public. Um, so this kind of got me thinking, well, like it's a really successful mobile game, but it's clearly got a lot more than that. So that's why it's, it's ended up going public. Um, and with King as well, I think 78% of their revenues come from Candy Crush alone. So that just shows how instrumental it is in their success as a business as well. So that's kind of what led me into, into researching more about the psychology of certain mobile games. Uh, that started with, uh, with me doing a bit of digging around on Candy Crush. Um, so everything I've got in this deck, it's all uh, referenced and uh, there's a source at the back as well. So it's not just me making it up. Um, so anyway, Candy Crush went public about a month ago um, for $7.6 billion. Uh, shares kicked off about $22.50. But if you've been following it for the last month, you'll know it's, it's definitely not at that price anymore. Um, had a price earnings ratio of around 13. Uh, so the market was already slightly sceptical as to whether it could continue growing at the rapid pace that, that it had been uh, recently. Um, the good news uh, for Candy Crush was that it was actually profitable and it made $700 million profit in 2013. Um, so if you think about a lot of, lots of other tech companies, um, they get investment and buyouts and sometimes they even go public without making profit, um, which kind of contra contradicts certain business logic. Um, but nowadays in this, in this mad tech world which we're living in, it's not always essential for, for companies to make profit. But with Candy Crush, let's hope that um, that will be its saving grace and its share price will bump back up. Uh, it's also the biggest float from a European tech firm uh, since Yandex, which is a Russian search engine uh, that went public, I think, in 2011. So it's good to see some, um, some IPOs coming across from this side of the pond and not just having the Americans steal them all. So, like I said, um, Candy Crush, it got absolutely nailed on day one on the markets. Um, it started off at $7.6 billion at 10 a.m., uh, on the New York Stock Exchange um, and then by the end of the day it had lost 15% of its value. Um, I think it went down to 5.9 billion um, at the end of day one and then it lost a further 3% on day two. Um, so as of uh, Friday the 17th of April I think it was valued around 17 bucks a share. Um, so its current valuation is about 5.6 billion dollars. Um, so it's lost a hell of a lot um, in the opening month. But there is hope if you compare it to something like Facebook um, that had a similar story that plummeted on the opening day um, and continues to plummet for the next uh, couple of months or so. Uh, it took the best part of a year, slightly over, um, to get back up to the price which it originally floated at as well. Um, if you consider another company such as Zynga, which is perhaps more of a direct competitor to King, uh, I don't think that still hasn't reached its, its share price um, then it initially kicked off like that, just plummeted and, and just kept falling. Um, so we'll see where it goes. Let's hope the, uh, the $700 million in profit is a, is a bit of a good sign for King. So let's get on to the psychology now. So why has Candy Crush been so successful? So first of all is that it makes you wait. So for those of you who have played Candy Crush, um, you'll realise that um, you have five lives. And um, once you've used those five lives up, um, you then end up being locked out of the game. 
uh, you then have to wait half an hour before you're allowed to play again. Um, and then you can go back in, use up your another five lives, and then you get locked out again, and you have to wait half an hour each time. So this is a really good tactic because it helps users structure their day a lot more. So if I'm playing uh, first thing in the morning, um, I then use up my five lives, I'm locked out for half an hour, I can go and do something, go and make a cup of coffee or something like that, and then I can come back um, in half an hour's time, and I can, I can know that I'm going to have the opportunity to play again. So this is a really interesting tactic, and it's not just being used by Candy Crush and by King. Um, on the left here, um, I've pulled an App Annie screen grab uh, from an app which I worked, worked closely with last summer um, down in Spain. This is an app called Color Mania, and they use the exact same tactic where I think you had three lives or so, and once you used up those three lives, you were then locked out of the game for half an hour. So again, like I said, this is really good because it, it kind of keeps the user more engaged during the day. Um, so it's not just saying you've lost your lives, you've got to, that's it. Um, it gives you an opportunity in half an hour's time to play again. So what this means is that it means that users um, play more throughout the day, um, so you're getting more active use, and that's something which Apple takes into its algorithm as well. It's not just purely focused on, on the amount of downloads, but it's the activity that you get within your app as well. Um, and as you can see with the app Annie rankings of uh, Color Mania, uh, that was very successful um, for the UK. That was in the top well, top few anyway, um, for the best part of nine months or so. So that was doing really, really well. So it just shows that that's a tactic which can be um, copied by, by, by yourselves, essentially. Secondly is that we're all suckers for sweet talk. So as you're playing Candy Crush, you flick four candies in a row and they zap away and words pop up on a screen along with a voice that says something like sweet or delicious. And this feedback becomes essential for player immersion. And this is really interesting because this is essentially Candy Crush tapping into, into three of your, your core senses. So first of all, and actually I'm going to go back a couple of slides here just to, just to make my point. So when I was putting this deck together, I kept staring at these, at these, um, these candies here. Um, and it's just because they're so beautifully designed. It is a really, really high quality design. Um, and I just kept staring at them thinking, wow, they look really good. And then if we go back to Candy Crush, once you're seeing that within the game, and then once you see the voiceover uh, and the words pop up saying delicious, subconsciously you're making that association between, wow, it looks really good, somebody's telling me it's delicious, and then you can almost taste just how good it is as well. So that's really interesting. If games can start tapping into these sort of senses um, that people have, um, you're starting to market towards them and engage them on a much deeper level than just with, um, with um, in-app marketing and stuff like that. Um, so this is pure, deep psychological marketing. Dr. Kimberly Young, who's a pioneering expert on internet gaming and addiction, uh, she says that positive rewards, such as hearing sweet or delicious, are the main reason why people become addicted to things. So you're not going to get addicted to somebody telling you you're rubbish at the whole time if you get exposed to constant positive positivity, um, such as these, these words, then essentially you're going to feel better uh, when you feel, when you play Candy Crush, you feel better about yourself as a person, so you're in that positive mind, mindset the whole time. Number three is you can play with one hand. Um, so there was a stat which I read the other day which says that um, I think 70% or there or thereabouts of uh, mobile gamers play games on their phone while they're commuting. Um, so this is really interesting because what Candy Crush have done is kind of say, okay, well, yeah, that's great, but if we can um, make it make you be able to play with one hand, that kind of opens up the possibilities of how you can play while you're commuting. So obviously you're not going to play Candy Crush while you're driving, but if you're taking the, the tube in London or if you're taking the train to work or something like that, um, then if you're holding onto a pole, then you've got one hand which you can't use. So then with the other hand, it's a perfect opportunity to get, get Candy Crush out and start playing. Um, a game which I play quite often is, is stick cricket. Um, so with that, you have to hit the hit the the ball with the bat um, by having your left thumb over one side of the screen and your right your right thumb over the over the other side. So obviously that's using two hands, which kind of limits the amount of times where I can play it. I literally have to be sat down somewhere or lying in my bed at the end of the day or something like that. So it's interesting to see what what Candy Crush have done is they've kind of say, well, how can we split open this this market of people who are commuting and where are the where are the available gains if you like um, of opportunities where where we can start 
allowing people to play not just in the obvious locations. You also can't lose with Candy Crush. Um, so if you run out of options on a board, uh, the board immediately resets, so you never get stuck, um, so you can't lose. And uh, Dr. Dina Miller, who's a psychiatrist who studied the addiction of Angry Birds, says this is part of the reinforcing pattern which keeps you playing. So this touches onto what I said a couple of slides ago, is that if you're in this positive mindset, um, then and you're never exposed to that negativity or, or that fear of losing, um, then you're constantly going to have positive feelings towards it, and that's going to addict you in the sense that people cling to pos positivity and good feelings. So if you're getting that sense out of Candy Crush, then that's going to make you want to play it more and more. Um, if I give you an example with myself, um, a game which I've played really frequently down the years is a game called Football Manager. Um, and I end up being, uh, being fairly rubbish at Football Manager and I play for about um, 10, maybe 20 games before I end up getting sacked as the manager of a Premier League football club. Um, I then give up and uh, go and do something else. Um, so that's because I've been exposed to that, that losing side. I then think enough is enough, I don't want to play anymore. And this is something which I'll come on to more a bit later on. Candy Crush is also an escape um, from our everyday lives. Um, so most people have a, a similar routine every single day. Um, most people get up at the same time, take the same, same route to work or wherever they're going um, during the day. Um, and most people are generally exposed to, to negativity during their lives. So with all the posit positivity that Candy Crush has within it, um, it really helps distract people from whatever else is happening within their lives. Um, also playing um, Candy Crush to the tune of upbeat music uh, makes it a perfect stress reliever, according to Kimberly Young. And also, because it's playing with candies, um, it really takes us back to, to how we felt when we were children. Um, I think most people, have, well, when you're a kid anyway, uh, you generally have a positive feeling towards candies and towards sweeties, um, and that generally doesn't disappear too much as you go up to being an adult. Yeah, you might eat them less um, because we all mature, um, but generally, you've still got that warm association, thinking, oh yeah, when I, when I was a kid, I used to eat lots of candies, and it kind of takes you back to that, that young time where you didn't have any problems within your life. So it's interesting to see quite how deep that can go uh, within human beings as well. The game's also familiar, um, so you probably remember Bejeweled, which um, was a very similar concept, but instead of popping candies on a screen, you're popping jewels. Um, so this was the original concept before Candy Crush came along and even with Candy Crush I think they had about five iterations of the game before they eventually landed on the, the whole candy theme. I think their first theme was that originally it was a French bakery and, um, and I don't know exactly what happened during the game at that point but, um, but eventually they had five iterations and then ended up uh, playing with candies. So what they did is they kind of took this successful concept, which Bejeweled has, and you can see on the app Annie graph there just how successful it was for a long time until about January 2014 um, when you start seeing um, the impact that Candy Crush is having on it. So it's taken a, a really successful concept and really simple concept, but just overlaid it with the psychological cues to make us kind of more, more deeply addicted um, into the game, which is really interesting. So... A tactic for, for mobile gamers such as you guys on Mobile 10X is if there's a successful concept that's working, copy it and just make a few twists to it. And if, if you can start applying these psychological cues to go into some really deep marketing, um, then you could potentially be very successful. And obviously, I hope you are. Um, frequent updates equals hedonic adaptation. So hedonic adaptation is the tendency to return to an established state of happiness despite changes in life. And this is something which is at the core of all human beings. So to put this into plain English, essentially what this means is that the more we have of something, the worse it gets. So if I go to the bar and I start, and I have a pint of beer, um, the first one would always taste the best. And then the more I have, the more drunk I end up becoming. Um, and generally the worse they become, the worse, the worse they taste. Similar with, with chocolate cake as well. The first slice of cake you have always tastes the best. And the more slices you have afterwards, you just end up feeling fattened and bloated. And this is exactly the same with mobile apps as well. So as you can see with the picture on the left, when you download the app, you're really excited because it's something new, it's something interesting which you haven't seen before. And then generally over time, your happiness returns to the, to the original state that it was before you downloaded the app. And that's eventually when you stop playing. So you've probably seen the stats on, on Flurry as well um, about how quickly 
um, users leave the apps or stop playing them as well. Um, so a good way to, to prevent this and to extend the, the product lifecycle of, of your app or of your mobile game is to really frequently update it, but not just do standard bug fixes, but to actually release new content. And this is something which Candy Crush do really well. Um, I think they've had, since they started, I think they've had about 26 updates, which is high above the average. And whenever they update, they release new content. So then, as you can see, the results are shown with the graph on the right, is that whenever there's an update, people have an increased state in happiness, and then that eventually reverts back to the mean, um, and then it picks up again when they do another app, uh, another update as well. So that's really interesting to see how updates can be used to not just extend the product lifecycle, but to also engage with the user, make them happier, and then if you've got them in this happy mindset, then you can get creative and there's all sorts of other possibilities which you could start going into. Maybe this means they'll be more happy to share stuff on social media or talk about you more. Um, so the game is really yours to play then. So to kind of make a point or make half a point, this is an example of um, hedonic adaptation in action. Uh, this is an example just to change it up. Uh, this is Dragon City rather than Candy Crush. Um, and what I've done here is highlighted um, since about July 2013, every time they've released uh, an app update. And you can see on the day that it's released, um, there's always been a peak um, in the rankings. The ranking has always gone up, so they've got higher up the App Store rankings. Now, I'm not saying, saying that the, the increase in the rank is purely because of hedonic adaptation, because obviously when you release a, an update, there's going to be an increase in, in downloads anyway. Um, but generally, if you can start engaging your, your user base more by making them come back and start playing with your new content that you're pushing through, that's going to increase your, your user activity. Um, you're going to have more act active users throughout the day from your existing user base. Um, and that's going to help bump up the rankings as well. Um, so it's these small possibilities um, where you can keep adding on to them um, to create a successful marketing strategy. So Candy Crush also use coercive monetization. Um, so you probably will be familiar with this, maybe not by name, but coercive monetization, coercive monetization is essentially the in-app currency that you play with. So you can see on the uh, picture on the top right um, with Candy Crush that um, is asking you to buy um, gems and on the picture below with Simpsons Taps Out, um, your, the in-app currency is donuts and you're being asked to pay 10 donuts here for the Jebediah statue. Um, so the reason, coercive monetization is the reason why um, in-app currency exists and why it's different to normal currency. So by having an extra layer between real money and, and the, the user who's making the decision whether I should buy or not, um, it, is, it sounds awful, but it helps trick them into making a purchase without the complete information. So this is essentially because we find it hard to value new things. Um, so if I'm trying to, if I want to buy the Jebediah statue, I'm not going to know how many dollars equals equals 10, 10 donuts. So because it's the in-app currency, I'm kind of thinking, well, yeah, I'm in a positive mindset because I'm within the game. Um, yeah, what the hell, I'll go with it because it's not saying pay uh, $10, it's saying pay 10 donuts. I don't, I can't really value that. Um, now this, this sort of decision as to weigh up the, the short-term costs versus the long-term opportunity gain, um, this happens in a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And this doesn't properly develop within humans until you're about 25. Um, so this is a really good tactic for kind of targeting younger users. And you've probably heard the stories recently over the last few weeks and months um, about, um, about really young kids going onto their parents' iPads, starting to play games, and then rank, racking up loads and loads of costs because they keep doing the in-app purchase. Um, so that kind of taps into to the child's slightly weaker developed mind um, because they don't know how to make the, the decision as to whether it's worthwhile in the long term because it's something which, which they think, oh, it's a bit of fun and I can't value it as well. And research shows that pitting even one intermediate currency between the consumer and real money, such as a game gem, makes the consumer much less adept at valuing the, um, the transaction. With Candy Crush, you also experience fun pain. Now, this is something which um, Roger Dickey from Zynga came up with. Um, so, like that business is, is successful um, because it solves pain points in people's lives. Um, so, this is something which Candy Crush have kind of thought about deeply 
is that yeah just playing the game because it's a game it doesn't solve a problem within your life it's just it's entertainment it's a bit of fun but what if we can start putting pain points into the game so as i said at the start that whenever you run out of lives um, you're then locked out of the game for half an hour you can then either ask your friends for more lives or you can buy facebook tokens as you can see down here and because that's tokens that's coercive monetization which they're built into it as well um, so they're putting the customer into a pain point and then they're saying these are the options if you want to solve that pain um, in the short term um, by either asking your friends which is um, viral marketing and reciprocity which we'll come on to later excuse me um, and then you have the option to buy with Facebook tokens as well so that wraps up the Candy Crush um, side of the deck um, so I hope you're still with me. Um, so now we're going to look at the psychology of city building games um, and we're going to use examples from SimCity, from Farmville and from Clash of Clans and I've drawn out eight tactics which these guys are using to kind of tap into the user's psychological um, mindset. So first of all is the presence of reciprocity um, within social games or within city, game, city building games and reciprocity is essentially why viral marketing occurs. So reciprocity is the impulse that we feel to return favours. Um, so this is, for example, if, uh, if I'm on Farmville and I send somebody a digital sheep, um, then reciprocity theory dictates that because they received it, um, they then feel the need to send something else on to either myself, um, they could send something back to me, or they could send something else, uh, something on to another one of their friends. And that's essentially how content starts spreading through the digital Twitterverse. Um, so with SimCity Social, um, you can once a day send a gift to a player. So this kind of taps into what we spoke about right at the start with um, with Candy Crush, is that this gives you another reason to open up the game. So if uh, if you thought, uh, well, I'm not too bothered about playing SimCity and, and building a city, but uh, if I've got the option to send something to a friend, I want that positive feedback when they send something back to me. Um, that's going to give you a reason to open it up and then you've got the user within the game and then you can start engaging with them and either you start using adverts and hope they click on an advert which obviously generates new revenue um, or you can hope they start funneling through the game to become more loyal and eventually an advocate. Um, and then uh, this is something which is re rewarded uh, within SimCity as well. So you can request gifts and um, you get points for every gift that you accept. So this is the, game, the gamification then of reciprocity and it's, it's a rewarding people uh, for being social sharers within the game um, with relevant content. So whenever you receive um, an, a, a gift within SimCity, um, this will then send you a Facebook notification and this is the call to action to your friend to start playing the game. Uh, if I want to send um, that energy um, item right in the middle there, um, if I send that to somebody, they'll get a Facebook notification saying you've received uh, an extra energy thing use this uh, within SimCity, start playing now. So that's the call to action. So there are two types of reciprocity. Um, you can either receive uh, reciprocity positively or you can receive it negatively. So if you're like me and you're a bit of a, a, bit, a, bit of a grumpy bugger, um, then you might take to Facebook like this guy here um, who says, if you don't stop sending me farm vault requests, I'm gonna call the police. Um, so obviously this isn't great because it's bad PR and it's obviously it's on social media. Um, so it's, it's really key to keep tracking if you're using reciprocity to kind of track who's talking about your brand online as you, as you would do anyway. Um, and if this comes from an influencer um, who's got, um, he's got a lot of Twitter followers or something like that, then the impact can start spreading. Um, for example, if it was Justin Bieber, who's got millions of, of Twitter followers, um, then they could all be impacted by this. So it's not necessarily a, a piece of a, a brand message which you're putting out, just by having people share your content around. Um, if somebody receives that negatively, um, then that can start generating bad publicity as well. So an example of positive reciprocity um, is what Candy Crush had done. And there was actually controversy between what Farmville did and what uh, Candy Crush did. Um, so Farmville were essentially accused of outsourcing their marketing to the wider world by saying, yeah, start sending digital sheep um, around to your friends. Well, there's no real value or there's no benefit to the end user. But with Candy Crush, they've kind of said, okay, well, we see what Farmville have done. Let's learn from their mistake and let's make reciprocity valuable for the end user. 
Um, so when you run out of lives, um, then yeah, you can send um, yeah, you can send lives uh, to one of your friends within Candy Crush when they've run out. So this is really useful. So it goes back to the fun pain that we spoke about before, is that if you're in that point of um, of pain, um, and then you can request lives from one, from one of your friends and they come to save the day, then you're going to feel a lot better about that. There's an actual added value for you because it means you can start playing the game immediately rather than perhaps just a piece of, of gimmicky content um, like Farmville were accused of sending out. So what I've done here is kind of map out how reciprocity affects the customer journey. Um, so reciprocity is going to come from somebody who's, a, who's an advocate of your game. Um, so this is somebody who's gone all the way through the funnel. Um, if it's positive, positive, positively received, there we go, um, then it's going to go, it's essentially going to go all the way back through again. So you can imagine that the line is going to extend all the way down, um, probably to the conversion stage. Um, because, for example, if we go back to the example with the SimCity and the Facebook notification, if they action on that and then go into the game to use that energy stick, um, then it's got, they've gone through consideration, straight to conversion, and then obviously the more they play, the more loyal they become and the more opportunities there is for having them to convert into a paying player. Um, with negative reciprocity, um, it's not all that bad because it's actually, you end up sitting in the awareness stage still, um, but the more you think about it, then you're actually generating your, your own effective frequency marketing, which is something which I'll come on to in a few slides time. So it's key to look out for negative reciprocity, but it's also, it's not the end of the world because people are still thinking about your brand. So we need to monetize reciprocity. Um, and I'm sure this is something which you guys all know already about the conversion rates of, uh, of users from uh, players to payers. Um, a quote here from Mark Pincus says that 1-2% to of the users will end up spending money within the game. And Jim Greer, who runs a social gaming company called Congregate, says you have 2 two and a half, maybe 3% of people, depending on the game, um, who end up converting from players to payers. Um, but the average amount can go really high after that. Uh, it can actually get as high as about 60, 60 bucks a month. Um, that's according to Jim Greer. So obviously these are the sorts of people that we want to target um, with to be using our games. We want the big users um, coming and we want to we want to find the whales. Um, so I've got a quote here from a, a video game psychologist called Nick Lavelle, and he's saying that anywhere from 1% to 20% of gamers can be converted from players to payers. So this is this is essentially the, the Pareto law. Um, so we've already looked at at the wider market and it's probably about one to three percent of the market will end up converting and then how can we find the whales within that group within that one to three percent so we're trying to find that that twenty percent who's going to generate the eighty percent of the revenue so if you didn't know what Pareto law is it's essentially um, the twenty percent of customers who are going to generate the eighty percent of the revenue so in order to find these whales uh, we need to offer certain bait if you like to try and coax them out and to try and have them um, purchasing frequently and ideally with high amounts. So a few tactics um, are to offer the options by early and frequently. So with Clash of Clans, um, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right corner, um, whenever you're playing Clash of Clans, really early on, especially within the tutorial as well, um, they flood you with options to buy the in-game currency, which is bags of gems. Um, and because they do, they're doing this frequently, it kind of makes the association that, yeah, these are a key part of the game and you're going to need these to be successful. They don't wait until level 10 or 20 when you've already had success within the game and you'll be thinking, well, I've got this far, I don't need them anymore. They do it really early on, so you know that actually I'm going to have to purchase some of these. Then what they do is, is they can offer small buys first. So, for example, this is um, they can actually improve on this as well. So the cheapest option they've got here is is what nine dollars for for 1200 gems so people might not go for that I don't think I'd go for that um, maybe if there was an option to to pay a dollar um, and you get a hundred gems then that's something which is a lot less risky uh, for the customer um, and they might think yeah I'm willing to take that punt uh, particularly if you're outside on 3g or 4g maybe you might not trust your your connection and you might think the transaction will be lost um, so it kind of helps build up that trust that once you've got something little, then you can go on and do the next stage. So it's really key to try and get that first buy-in soon. Even if it's really low, um, then at least it's a buy. And I think studies have shown that once users buy once, they're more likely to buy and buy again. 
um, in the future. So competition is something which I'm going to come on to uh, next and also coercive monetization as well which I've touched on before. So uh, Clash of Clans, you can see their in-game currency is, uh, is gems rather than dollars. Um, so you're using the dollars to buy the gems um, and that's the, that's the layer between the, the actual transaction and the customer. So who are whales? So whales essentially want their game to be as perfect as possible and they want their game to beat everybody else's, especially all of their friends. So this is telling us that whales are perfectionists and they're also highly competitive. So perfectionism um, is actually a bit of a social defect within people um, and it actually comes from a lack of self-confidence that people have, which is why they go into games in the first place, because they want to feel good about themselves if they feel they can do really well. Um, maybe it's the same reason why I've become addicted to a football manager down the years is because I wanted to prove myself as an aspiring football manager, um, which unfortunately for me hasn't happened, um, which is why I'm now talking about app psychology. Um, so because of this, they go into the game and they want to, to really do well. So that creates the, the sort of um, com competitive element which they have. And then especially with your friends as well, they want to, because they know them personally, they've got that relationship, they want to feel better about themselves by beating them. So going back to an example from Candy Crush, within Candy Crush you've actually got a map um, of, um, of all your friends so you can see how well you're doing compared to them and you can really visualise that well which helps kind of keep the user engaged and you keep thinking, oh if I do a bit better then I'm going to beat um, Tom and I'm going to beat Harry as well. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting tactic as well is to start visualising how, how well you're doing in relation to your friends. Um, and because of this, um, whales typically end up spending more money within the game because they want to prove not just to themselves but also to their friends that they're doing well at something in life. Um, so this makes them highly loyal and they end up having a high lifetime value as well. So what's interesting is to start identifying common behaviour from whales um, and you can start to design games around them. So this might be in their behaviour that they have or the way that they engage with your adverts for your app. Um, or this might be within the behavior that they have once they're in-game as well. Um, perhaps they have really long sessions, um, or perhaps they have lots of short sessions. Uh, short sessions. Um, so it's interesting to try and identify where the money's coming from and what the behavior is, and then start building your games around whales, because that's the people who are, who are going to be spending the most money. Having said that, though, um, just because they're spending the most money, there could be other subsections who are going to be, who are going to be talking about your app more, perhaps on social media. So also keep in mind that it doesn't want to be 100% targeted towards whales, but obviously skew it towards them. But also keep in mind that there are, there are going to be other segments who could be really valuable to you, not just in a monetary sense, but perhaps in a promotional PR or marketing sense as well. So whales have actually um, identified themselves as perfectionists um, on online forums. So there's a, a guy here called Crisis um, who says, I have to do every challenge and collect everything in the game and I end up being sidetracked from actually enjoying the game. So this is interesting because if he's not actually getting that enjoyment, he's not going to become an advocate within the game and then start either doing reciprocity or start offering challenges to their friends. Um, so this is something which is key and that can actually, like well, as he's identified, it damages the, the game experience. Uh, a guy called Green Pale as well says he's restarted his um, his game over a hundred times because his character isn't completely perfect. And this is uh, I can relate to this as well. When again going back to my football manager examples, if I haven't won every single game for the first five or six games of the season, I end up restarting because I want to have a perfect record. Um, so I've got a bit of that perfectionism trait uh, within me as well. So it's interesting that because they're identifying that they are perfectionists, that means that you can start targeting your marketing towards this particular trait within them. So if they're if they if they if they're happily, if they're happy to kind of identify themselves on forums, they're gonna to relate to it more within your your banner advertising and stuff like that as well, um, which can kind of attract more, more whales into, the, into playing your game in the first place. So in terms of perfectionism and how it affects the customer journey, as I said, um, they're not going to become an advocate down here, um, so they're going to get to the loyal stage and then eventually they'll probably end up leaving um, or they just float around here and they keep playing but they're never going to go any further because they don't get that enjoyment which you get down at the advocacy stage. Uh, competition though um, is better, um, so you have your, your advocate um, and your challenger 
and they send a request uh, to a friend which acts as a call to action um, as their rival and their rival then ends up coming through the customer journey um, they'll consider it uh, pretty quickly um, if they want to challenge their friends and they'll convert pretty quickly as well and then they'll be left around the loyalty stage So humans also require social interaction, and this has been the case uh, with humans for, for well, ever since uh, ever since we were we were first created, if you like. Um, not that I'm a creationist. Um, so what I've done here is um, is kind of compare Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, to Farmville chat. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, for those of you that are aware of it, is kind of the basic levels of um, of engagement, I suppose, that we need um, as human beings. So it starts off with the physiological needs and the safety needs. So this is essentially a roof over your head and uh, and heating and food and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that if you've got those, then like you you shouldn't otherwise you shouldn't really be playing mobile games. And I'm not quite sure how they how they bought smartphones. Um, so anyway, to address the social needs, this is something which has been present uh, always with humans. Um, so years ago, we used to go down to to the pub or something like that, um, or go outside and meet people. And have conversations with them. Um, so nowadays, with uh, with mobile and particularly with everything going digital, uh, obviously all our conversations are now becoming digital. So this is something which which uh, games are taking into account. So this I kind of, again, it kind of goes back to the competitive nature that we spoke about um, before that uh, that whales have. So if you can chat with your friends, you're fulfilling that social need um, that you need as a human being. Um, and you're also engaging in a bit of competitive nature as well. So what Farmville have done is um, they pulled all, your, pulled all your friends. You can actually visualize their picture and you can really easily flick between which friends you want to have a chat with, uh, which makes it a lot more easier than having to go out into the streets, for example, as you would have had to do, have done hundreds of years ago and go and find every person individually. So how does social interaction affect the customer journey? Um, so your, your demand for social needs, they're essentially going to help you convert from considering the game to converting. Um, your esteem needs, which is where you need a bit of positivity and reinforcement. Um, so the more, pos more positivity you get um, from in Farmville, for example, so the more people you have saying, oh, wow, that's a really, really good design of a farm and I love it. Um, that's going to help you become more loyal because you'll keep going back in to get that positive reinforcement. And then eventually um, the self-actualization and showcasing stage, uh, that's when you become an advocate and going back to Farmville, that's when you can start sending your farm to other people saying, look how good this is. And then nowadays that is coming back in the form of these little things here, Facebook likes. So you don't actually need people to say, to verbally say, that's really good or I like it. Nowadays, just a, a Facebook like um, is enough to satisfy that demand within human beings. So again, SimCity, they've used um, coercive monetization. Um, so SimCity creates pain uh, for the user again. So we're talking about fun pain um, by making them wait in real time for their city to be built. So in order to solve that pain, uh, you need to buy bliss. But again, it's, it's going back to, to what we saw with Candy Crush as well um, and with uh, the Simpsons uh, tapped out with the donuts is how do we value bliss? Uh, we can't. So instead, uh, we have to buy gems and exchange them for bliss, which makes it harder for the brain to, to value the, the transaction. So what's interesting here is that by default, uh, the most expensive package um, is pre-selected for you. So all you need to do is just press continue um, and obviously accept those terms and conditions, um, and, and then you run your way. So by automatically selecting the most expensive um, package, it takes advantage of the status quo effect which is where generally human beings will accept what's given to them um, and, um, not, and most of the time they probably won't bother changing it. So for example with myself, uh, this is why on my iPhone uh, the home screen is pretty much in the same orientation, the same setup in terms of where the apps are as it was when Apple gave it to me. Um, and I haven't changed that, I've changed the subsequent pages on my iPhone um, where you get all the folders but because that's the default option, I've just, just gone, yeah, whatever, that's fine for me, and I've accepted it. So just by pre-selecting the, the default option um, it can help to convert users into paying for higher packages purely because they just go, yeah, whatever, that's fine. So obviously if you're targeting whales and they've got enough disposable income and they're prepared to, 
to spend money, then this is really interesting because they're more likely just to go, yeah, that's fine. Um, what's interesting within SimCity as well is that you can notice they've personalized um, the page here. So they've said, hi, Harold. And what this does is take advantage of the endowment effect. And this is where people assign more value to things purely because they own them or they perceive that they own them already. So just by personalizing it and making um, the user feel that they already own it, they're again, they're kind of shifted that little bit further towards thinking, well, actually, yeah, it's mine. So I'm more likely to buy it because it's, because it's mine um, rather than if, uh, if the personalization wasn't there. Um, In-game scarcity. Um, so this is um, the scarcity effect is the concept of, want, of people wanting something simply because they won't be able to have it soon. Uh, and SimCity offers you a deeply discounted building every time you level up. Um, so this is what we can see around here. So this is a pet salon, um, which is heavily discounted, 65% off. So just the same as you'll see within the high street and in a retail establishment, it's a sale. Um, but the irony is that because it's a digital uh, product, um, they can't run out of it, can they? Um, so it's just, it's there. But because of the way the game is made and because they've thought about it, they're going to say, oh, you'll never see this again. So it's a one-time offer. And then also you can see that layered with coercive monetization as well. So you're seeing the original price, which was 20. And now you're seeing the current price, which is uh, seven. And it's not dollars which you're paying with, it's in-game gems. Um, so you're kind of seeing a merge of different psychological um, cues there. So how does coercive monetization and scarcity affect the customer journey? Um, essentially, it helps to convert users from considering um, to become a paying user to actually becoming a paying user. So this is something which I mentioned earlier, the, uh, well, the effective frequency I mentioned earlier, um, and this ties into uh, the availability heuristic. So the effective frequency, um, you might be aware of the concept, maybe not by name, um, but this is essentially the amount of times that you need to be exposed to a brand before you can start recalling it more naturally. Um, so, for example, uh, if I'm on the Tube in London um, and I see a poster for Airbnb, as I've seen recently, uh, the more times I see it, eventually the more I'll be thinking about Airbnb within my head. Um, so, again, if we go back to the customer journey, then I'm floating around somewhere in the awareness stage and then I need to be presented with some sort of call to action to help me to consider it more, perhaps this would be content, um, and then eventually they'll they'll offer me a deal on a room or something, and then that will have me convert to a paying user. Um, so the more the more you see something, the more you think you've used it. Um, this is essentially the availability heuristic. Um, so, for example, going back to an example from uh, from nine eleven. So after the twin towers attack, um, there was an epidemic about terrorism, even though terrorist attacks were extremely rare. After that, that one happened, people thought it was an epidemic and people thought there were a lot more than there were in that short amount of time. So because of that, obviously, security increases and people start going over the top on, on certain things. Um, and to apply this to the, to the gaming world um, is that within social media, um, if you see uh, these things here, so Facebook ads, um, if you start becoming more and more exposed to those, um, say, for example, if I've played SimCity Social maybe two or three times within the week, but I've been exposed to this habit 20 times, then I might start thinking, well, actually, yeah, I've played it a lot, a lot more, or at least I'm thinking, well, yeah, actually, I played it those times and I did well. I need to go and play it again. Um, so SimCity Social taps into the availability heuristic by encouraging you to share your progress really, really frequently because they want as many of these um, adverts coming up from people as possible. Um, so again, I've mapped it out here. Um, it's essentially uh, the same as reciprocity, um, where if you if you receive um, the availability heuristic positively um, in terms of you your action on it and you, you don't mind seeing all these adverts for it in your Facebook feed, um, then you're going to convert um, and you're actually going to come all the way down. My green arrow going downwards has disappeared again, um, but you'll probably convert, end up in the consideration or possibly conversion stage. Um, and the negative, negative availability heuristic, um, again, you'll end up in the awareness stage, um, but you'll be thinking about the brand more, um, even if you don't particularly want to action on it. 
So in down to progress, um, this is where if you can visualize your progress, you're more likely to carry on and to achieve your goal. Um, so if we look at the bottom right picture, um, you can see how Candy Crush have, have built this in with their power bar. You can see how far along you are to completing the game. Um, so you're down there and to complete the game, obviously, you need to get up to the top. Um, and with SimCity, uh, what they do is they visualize your progress with hard hats. Um, and what's interesting about this is um, SimCity, they actually give you or they make it really easy for you to earn hard hats um, within the tutorial. So there was a study, which I'm trying to remember off the top of my head now, but it was done by, by two Portuguese guys, I think, when they went to a, a car wash um, and they split the, uh, the customers in half and um, they gave every single customer a, a, um, a, a card and that said when you have eight free um, when you've been eight times then you get a free car wash so for half the customers they gave them two free stamps to begin with and then for the other half they just gave them the card with no free stamps so they had to come eight times in order to get the free car wash so what was interesting with the group that had the two freebies to begin with is that they actually came more often and they left less time um, between their, their gaps in order to come so they could visualize how far along their progress they were. So that kind of made them more inclined to come back and come back more often. And that's what SimCity have essentially replicated within their game. So they've made it really easy for you to, to get, um, get hard hats really early on so you can carry on um, to achieve your goal as well. So benign and malicious envy are also present uh, within city building games and within social games. So these are two different types of envy. So malicious is where we want to ruin somebody and take everything they have. So for example, if somebody kills somebody, um, then generally there's an outcry and people want revenge on that person in a, in a pretty malicious way. But benign envy is where we think somebody deserves what they have. Um, so if, uh, if Patrice's app um, ends up becoming super successful overnight, um, then I'm going to probably have benign envy and I'm going to think, yeah, Patrice really deserves that because he's worked really hard with your story time um, and I want it to be um, successful. So benign envy is essentially what motivates us to pay money uh, in the game to get the same results as one of our friends. So again, it's time back to, to competition and uh, competitive nature of human beings. So um, what's quite amusing here is SimCity have actually um, given you options within the game to express your benign envy. Um, so you can either share a towel with somebody, find a quiet spot to pee in somebody's pool, or dive bomb their kiddie pool. So if you go to somebody's city and you think, wow, it's really good and it's better than mine, then you can start expressing your benign envy there. Um, so you're not ruining their city at all. You're just kind of leaving your mark and saying, well, yeah, I want, um, I want to kind of have a scratch at them, if you like. Uh, rather than punch them in the face um, because I, I need to get out some of my anger that I'm not at that level yet. And then once you've done that, then you're more inclined to start uh, paying money to achieve the same results. Uh, almost there now, um, if you're still with me. Um, so Timed Quests is, um, is present within SimCity and this is, um, this is where you have to do a quest over a, a period of time and then you get a free building at the end. Um, if you fail, um, then you, you then have to use the gems um, to buy the, the um, what have we got here, a swim stadium um, yourself. Um, so this is really interesting because this takes into, into account loss aversion. Um, so this is the concept where if I was 80% of the time, if, if I was 80% through my timed quest and then I ran out of time because I was busy doing something else, I would then lose and I would then have to pay um, to get that swim stadium with my own gems. So loss aversion is where generally we value losses twice uh, as much as we do with gains. Um, so I'll be th twice as more painful thinking, wow, I almost got there and then I lost it because I didn't get that final 20% 20 of the way there. So then you're more likely to kind of use your currency um, to kind of satisfy that that un that's uh, ill feeling that you have within yourself that you haven't got what you thought you were going to get if that makes sense um, so this is interesting for, for game developers to start thinking well how do we optimize our quests or our times quests to make sure that people kind of get 80 or 90 percent of the way there but then they're not always finishing it um, so how do we get the most amount of people almost finishing it and then not quite and then having to use their their in-game currency um, to pay for the item themselves so perhaps just to theorize, 
Maybe uh, this happens over a longer period um, than just a couple of days. If you have a quest that's, that takes a month or something, or maybe just a week, um, then people might start becoming more attached to it because they've invested more time in trying to get that reward. Um, they could just end up becoming more annoyed and angry if they don't get it. But then also maybe the, um, the loss aversion is stronger because they've, uh, they've been attached to it for so long. So how does psycholog psychology affect the customer journey? Um, so endowed progress, benign envy and timed quests, they essentially help you to become more loyal and then eventually lead you to becoming an advocate. And then once you're an advocate, then you start getting screens such as this one here from Farmville, which is where you can start inviting friends and um, they might ask you to send digital sheep again or something like that. So again, we're going back to reciprocity and the whole circle repeats itself. Um, so there I've listed some of the sources which I've used, so feel free to go and check those out if you're interested. And if there are any questions, uh, feel free to either comment in the forum, uh, private message me or email me at charlie at availablegains.com and I'll do my best to answer any questions you have. So well done if you've lasted all this time. Uh, if you have, I hope that means that you found it interesting. Um, so yeah, I'd love to, uh, to have a chat with you more about this and just brainstorm more ideas. Um, if, if you'd be interested in doing that. So thanks for your time, guys. Cheers.